fact that it matters for us shows that the revolution didn't succeed. That it failed, I think that's tragedy. It's not something that we should therefore conclude, well, we should never try that again. We should not use the Bolshevik revolution or its degeneration as an argument against experimentation itself. Human ability to transform, to, to change, is infinite, and, and we should see it as that. I think the historical impact of the Russian Revolution is often underestimated or even ignored today. It should be remembered and understood in its proper historical context as an event which changed the world. Everything that happened after it in the 20th century is in one way or another a reaction to the Russian Revolution. And the fact that it's now largely forgotten and ignored is, is a real shortcoming of our historical understanding and education. Trotsky, musing a bit later about the possibilities of the revolution, said, the point of the revolution was to unleash human potential, to make people Aristotle and Goethe and Marx, and to raise the ridge so that we could see over to the other side of what was possible. Or Victor Serge at the end of his trilogy, the last book, Midnight in the Century, when the protagonist escapes from a Stalinist uh, concentration camp, he goes up to people in a cafe and says, do you know who we are? You know, we are the possibilities of the future. And that's what we should remember about the Russian Revolution. And if I can misquote Rosa Luxemburg, who made the point that the only successful revolution is the last one. Just imagine being or living in Russia or living in Europe in January 1917 or in December 1916. And the way you view the world and, and the way you think about the future and just imagine that perception that you have in early 1917 to what actually occurs a few months later, almost like the unthinkable takes place, something that nobody expects. And I think that what that shows us is that history itself is not simply a process that kind of moves along steadily, but sometimes there are huge leaps that are taken where the present is transcended by very radical uh, and very kind of transformative processes. And it's that transformative moment which was, gives us this sense of exhilaration, not only express itself in the political sphere, but also in the cultural sphere and in the social sphere because everybody was involved. It was also the sense of many people who went there, the famously John Reed, the journalist, Louise Bryant. They were astonished at this level of activity. It showed what human beings can do in difficult circumstances and it was so inspirational and I suppose it's a really important point to emphasize today their ability to or willingness to take risks to experiment to do new things that had never been done before everything changed and you can see it all across the world uh, in a very practical way because people start joining communist parties these new communist parties. They'd been in socialist parties before, but the socialist parties had all joined in the war and so they'd thrown away their reputation, they'd become patriotic and small-minded. In Glasgow there's great revolutionary upsurge all through 1919. Uh, you can see it in Germany in the revolution that brought the war to a halt. They were inspired by the Bolshevik revolution. You can see it in Dublin. You can see it all across Africa and the Middle East, they can see that their conditions of existence are degraded and constrained, suddenly have a model for doing a different thing. And all across the world, there's this great upsurge of radicalism, activism, a huge left press, a great conversation about the future taking place. I think one of the reasons why I look upon the Russian Revolution the way that I do is because I had the privilege of living through the uh, Hungarian Revolution in October 1956. The October 1956 revolution had certain similarities with that of October 1917. And, and the main similarity was that ordinary people who a few months beforehand were overwhelmed by the struggle of everyday life and felt that they really had to devote all of their energies just merely to survive, all of a sudden, from one day to the next, became interested in political life and public life. And people began to read newspapers. People began to go out on the street and talk to one another. 
And all of a sudden, all these individuals who were disregarded as being relatively unimportant because they were ordinary, they were uneducated, were able to take matters into their hands. And in Hungary, they made a revolution and actually succeeded initially to defeat the Russian army uh, that was brought in to fight them. And similarly, in October 1917, you had a situation in a, on a much larger scale and in a more durable fashion where the kind of people that really were the objects of history, they were often disregarded as being unimportant, all of a sudden took to the streets of Petrograd and other places and took matters into their own hands and, and felt empowered and they felt strong enough to take charge of a difficult historical process and try to give it their own content and their own direction. And to that extent, what the Russian Revolution does show us is that you know, the people are not just simply the passive audience in the drama of history, but sometimes, rarely of course, on, on occasions, it can also be the main protagonist in that drama. And I think that's a, an interesting insight into the way that the world works. I'm interested in human freedom and how it could be taken further. And therefore, the Russian Revolution, its attempt to realize a grander, more sweeping and more authentic vision of human emancipation is of interest to me. And I think it should be of interest to everyone. If you had any interest in politics from the late 60s onwards, then you had to be aware of what I would say is the defining event of the 20th century. And you had to come to terms with what had happened and you also had to align yourself in relationship to organisations which w took a view on this. Uh, you can't avoid it, it's seminal. As somebody who grew up in South Africa and witnessed apartheid and attempted to try and do something about it, as somebody who was interested in justice and, and, and changing South Africa, I was fascinated by all examples of change that has occurred. The Bolshevik Revolution for me, when I began to learn about it and read about it, was an incredible inspiration. It was something that I read furiously about. You just remember that in South Africa at that time, all these books like Lenin, uh, Marx and all, they were all banned. It was like, you know, for children, you say you can't do that, so you go and do it. So I, I was immediately attracted to that. But the more I began to read around it, the more I understood what that represented it kind of kindled my aspiration to, to want to transform the world. In the middle of the First World War, the existing alliance system, the existing geopolitical realities were fundamentally coming unstuck. And they were coming unstuck throughout the world. This is a period when many of the old empires are unraveling the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire. There are big revolts in the, in the British Empire. And not only that, but the old regimes, whether in Germany or elsewhere, were losing their capacity to reproduce the system. The thing about the Tsar and his court is he was like a weirdo freak. The guy was so strange. The more intense the struggle around him was, the more kind of like Mr. Pooter he was, like, or Mr. Bean. You know, he was this uh, odd, fastidious man. There's a diary, you can read his diary, and all these cataclysmic events are going on, and he's saying, oh, I shot a couple of birds today and had tea outside. And you're thinking the whole world is changing, and he's in denial. It's a very royal attitude, actually. It's the essence of monarchy, is that he's utterly indifferent uh, to the mass. You know, in Tsar Nicholas's court, there's this crazy Rasputin guy. There's all this kind of weirdness. People making shed loads of money from the war, you know, and they're living the high life while everybody else outside is miserable and starving and hungry. And all hatred is basically is on the Tsar. So that when he does go, there's a kind of hiatus. It was a, a uniquely fragile and weak society that was curiously both extremely backward in terms of its feudal agrarian structures but in many respects, it was also very advanced. Its urban, uh, working class, industrial base was fairly advanced. And yet this uh, tension that occurred within that society, which meant that the Russian regime was far less resilient, far less robust in being able to deal with the uh, challenges to its rule. When you look 
at the life experience of ordinary Russians. All of their lives were being turned inside out all the time. Over short periods, like a generation, millions had moved from the countryside into the town and that was a new experience for them. They were working in factories, that was a new experience for them. All their social relationships, all their human relationships were turned inside out and then they were changed again because after being dragooned into the factories, many, many millions more were dragooned into the army. So first they were being bullied and pushed around by factory owners, and then they were being bullied and pushed around by uh, captains and generals, often shooting at them, you know, or leading them into gunfire. So their lives were already in turmoil. And then they decided to take a control of that process. Let's try and understand the position of a working class area like the Vyborg, uh, one of the leading working class areas of, of Petersburg, Petrograd. Of course, there was a level of deprivation. So there was an economic stimulus to revolt, and this was particularly acute given the experience of the war. But the most striking thing is that how very quickly, uh, although there were coherent trade union demands for an eight hour working day and, and things like that, how quickly the movement transformed itself from a trade union or economic discussion into a, a discussion about politics and about grasping a whole new world of control and of freedom uh, and of uh, power. The crowd thus witnessed open exchanges of political opinions in the course of which opposing ideas were pitted against one another. When the February Revolution happened, lots of people were surprised and they looked at the intensity of the social conflict it was in Petrograd, in St. Petersburg, particularly in a suburb called Weiburg, it started. And the people that were writing about it and talking about it afterwards were so surprised by the intensity of the conflict that they often would talk about it as a kind of a spontaneous thing. One man would enter a discussion with another and passers-by would listen in. It was physics, you know, that under pressure something had cracked. As though they weren't real people that were doing this, as though they were kind of a, a, an animal species that had reached some kind of tipping point that meant that they would uh, go off in some other direction. But most people said that because they didn't know the people who were doing it. And they're very precise events that uh, led to the revolution. There's a precursor to the February Revolution, which is in Petrograd. There was a quite an intense level of argument and politics and uh, political debate in the preceding period, particularly in 1905, when there'd been a kind of a very powerful revolution that had failed, but nonetheless had drawn many, many people into the, the uh, hard left groups that were leading the revolution. And lots of people were taking part in, both in trade union activism, but also in what were called the Russian Social Democratic and Labour Party, the, the left wing of politics, and arguing about politics and about Marxism and about revolution. So it wasn't as if these people didn't know about politics, they were unduly political, they were very, very political. The people who did this were not the most poor people in Petrograd. They were the most organised people in Petrograd, the ones with the highest aspirations. A significant section, you know, not a tiny minority, can galvanise and inspire the rest of the population. And it doesn't have to be everybody, it just has to be a critical mass. And what really inspired them was the sense that they could be in control. That's one of the things that Lenin understood better than anybody else. It's that people actually believed that they could run their own lives. The Bolshevik Revolution wouldn't have happened without the First World War. That's a very important point to, to, to grasp. The imperialist powers essentially were going to war with each other to try and defend their empires, where the relationship between militarism, you know, patriotism, nationalism, and plunder and war and imperialist oppression all suddenly came together in a way that people have been denying that there was an inherent connection between you know, military you know, barbarism on a scale that had never been seen before and the capitalist, capitalist society itself. Through Lenin's analysis, the fate of war and revolution had become increasingly tied together. Lenin was 
the only major leading figure, if not the only figure, who was most committed to ending the war. And he went even further. He's thought that the revolutionaries and those who were committed to ending the war had to support the military defeat of their own governments. The patriotic loyalty that the state could command in wartime had to be broken by resolute opposition to the state itself. And his line was to convert the slaughter of the world war into a civil war that would overthrow the existing powers that be. Alfred Comrie, my grandfather, fought in the First World War. He was in the Army Ordnance Corps. He was in the British Socialist Party at the time. The British Socialist Party supported the First World War. So he, when he joined the war, he joined it as a patriotic socialist. And the family story goes that Alf was charged with looking after some German POWs whilst other units, fighting units, went forward to, to defeat Germany. And in those weeks, whilst he was looking after those German soldiers, their English was very good and they got into all sorts of political discussions. And they said to him, uh, the workers of the world have no country. This war is, is a war for the capitalists and a war for profit. And we shouldn't be fighting each other and killing each other. We should be supporting Lenin um, and his struggle for peace, bread and land in Russia. And when Alfred Count Comrie left the war, he didn't leave as a patriotic socialist, he left as an unpatriotic communist. He went back from the war and he joined the British Communist Party as a founder member. I've got a, a, a service medal here. On the front there is an angel with, with wings and on the back it says the Great War for Civilization, 1914 to 1919. Alf knew that it wasn't a great war for civilization. He knew it was the mass slaughter of uh, working class people. When you look at the way the Russian army fought, there's a massive preponderance of Russians. They really ought to have swept up. But they, the relationship that they had with their officers was, it was like dictatorship. It was, there was no respect. They brutalized them. Uh, they were rebellious and mutinous or truculent. They were always deserting, just people legging it and running away and whole platoons would disappear. They'd run home to look after their starving families and to get back to the farm. They'd run off because they hated the way that they were treated. They'd run off because lots of them were had very quickly become very fervently anti-war. And that meant that it wasn't any kind of effective army. And one of the central features of the soldiers' demands was to be treated as human beings, to be allowed to come out in the light of day, that they were equal, they weren't, they weren't subordinate to anything. Women were instrumental to the Russian Revolution right from the get-go. And in fact, the February Revolution begins with a march of women workers on March 8th, International Women's Day. When the February Revolution happened, all the textile workers tended to be women and the people in the metals factories tended to be men. So the textile workers decided that because it was International Women's Day, they wanted to have a protest and it seemed obvious to them from their previous experience, the thing to do was to have a strike. And the politicos, you know, the Bolsheviks and the uh, socialists, uh, weren't quite ready for that. And they said, well, do you think that's wise? You know, we're gonna cause a problem. Is it all gonna drop on our heads? But the women weren't really listening. They were thinking, we're, we're going to do something. So they organized the strike. Then they said, well, we'd better get the men out too. So they'd sent people off to the metal factories and the engineering factories and struck them out. The whole thing, in about five days, it, it, it blossomed really quickly into this huge conflagration. And as the Marxists and the socialists feared, the reaction from the authorities was going to be tough, you know, so they did get Cossacks to attack them and they got policemen and soldiers to attack them. But on each occasion, what would happen is that the strikers and the protesters who were on the streets milling around, you know, demanding control of the streets, tried to challenge the people that were sent to beat them up. 
you know, so the first were Cossacks. You know, Cossacks are own their own horses. They're not cavalry in the ordinary sense. They're people of property. So they're stolid, conservative kind of people. But an interesting thing happened where the crowd parted to make a corridor so that instead of charging through the crowd, what happened was the Cossacks chose to go through the corridor. And this happened three or four times, meaning to say that the Cossacks were choosing not to have a straight on fight and the crowd were encouraging them to say no don't do this and as this happened it became clear the Cossacks were winking at the crowd, the crowd were waving at them. It was a huge moment because just at the point when you're about to get battered the people that are supposed to batter you are, say, are listening to you saying oh oh yeah these are people too and, and choose not to. But something goes wrong. The army joins the people. There's another famous confrontation between the, the, the protesters and the soldiers in the Nevsky barracks. And a platoon of the barracks had been out and shot at some of the protesters. And the wives and the mothers went to the barracks and said, what do you think is going on? You know, one of your platoons has been out shooting at us. And at this point, you would imagine that soldiers would say, get lost. But instead, they didn't like this. And they said, oh, we'll go and fetch them. So a platoon was sent out to stop the platoon. There's a great line in Trotsky's History of the Russian Revolution where he's talking about a man who is conducting the trams on the, the main prospect. And, and the trams are reordered so that they don't mess up a demonstration or a line of people coming across. And Trotsky makes a point. He says, you know, the man conducting the trams had become a factor in world history. And that's right, because all of those things were conscious decisions that people made. With incredible swiftness, the Tsar's regime falls. A.N. Kerensky, a young lawyer, is made Minister of Justice in a provisional government in which many parties are represented. The February 1917 revolution, which led to the fall of the Tsar and the establishment of the provisional government with the promise of constituent elections, was welcomed by many people in the West. It was seen very much as, a, as an OK democratic uh, upheaval against a, a particularly oppressive regime. I think nobody had any doubt that the Tsarist regime was an unusually backward and reactionary one, a bit of an embarrassment to even to its allies. And also many people hoped that with the regime change in Russia in February that Russia would be more able to fight in the war and be a, an effective player in containing particularly the, the German advance. They thought, well, great, you know, Kerensky, he'll be a bit more like kind of Lloyd George character, you know, a liberal democratic government, they thought, like us. And so they were very relieved and pleased that a more plausible leader was there to lead the, the Russian war effort. And it allowed them to claim that they were standing for democracy. In fact, it was a slightly bogus claim, as in Kaiser Wilhelm's Germany, they already had universal male suffrage, which didn't exist in Britain. And the provisional government was one of the most liberal in the whole of Europe. It introduced freedom of press, freedom of assembly, and all kinds of civil liberties, which had not existed anywhere in Tsarist Russia, and indeed didn't really exist anywhere else in Europe. Kerensky, who issued the order of the day, I call on the army, fortified by the strength and spirit of the revolution, to take the offensive. People think, oh great, you know, we got rid of the Tsar. The revolution has succeeded. They're not really thinking about what comes next. And what came next naturally was what was underneath the Tsar, which was the Duma, their parliamentarians, lawyers and wealthy people. It lacked a real base within Russian society. And the Kerensky government was not really able to uh, provide satisfactory answers to the, to the real questions that faced both the peasantry and, and the urban poor. For example, they had no solution to the agrarian question, which was a really major issue uh, within Russia. They had no solution to the demand for food, for bread. And in particular, I think what the Kerensky government overlooked was this incredibly powerful aspiration within Russian society for peace. I think by that time, the anti-war sentiments had become extremely pervasive. Today, when we think of anti-war, we tend to think of being opposed to war means moral opposition to the consequences of war, whereas the anti-war activism of the militants and radicals who were in the Bolshevik party associated with Lenin, Lenin's allies, they took their anti-war position to the logical conclusion 
which they saw as political transformation and also hostility to not only to the enemy state, but also to their own states. And they saw their political responsibility as having to overthrow their own states as a result of their anti-war opposition. It wasn't simply registering your discontent or a pacifistic opposition to war in general, but that the only way to stop the war was to overthrow the ruling elites who were responsible for launching the war in the first place. In a sense, the idea that somehow the Kerensky government could have retained its power for any length of time is fairly uh, unrealistic. Very quickly, the people that made the revolution in February saw that this wasn't the answer. Crowds poured into the streets calling for peace, bread and freedom and for the overthrow of the provisional government. Usually when you look back upon history, there's a tendency to exaggerate the roles of individual leaders. But at the same time, you know, we have to remember that there are moments in, in history when somehow, somewhere, somebody has to give a lead. Somebody has got to have the ability to, uh, in a sense, personify the aspiration for change. And I think that uh, to a considerable extent, Lenin was uniquely placed in being able to do that. Lenin had been a lifelong revolutionary from a teenager. His elder brother had been executed for his opposition to the Tsar. And Lenin had been someone who was devoted to developing a, a very coherent, very uh, disciplined, uh, but extremely rigorous, theoretically and practically, political party. And in a sense, the Bolshevik party, which was a section of the Russian Social Democratic Party, was his party. He was the one that determined its direction and won arguments and kept it attuned to the particular circumstances, which were most importantly their response to the working class and how the working class could be uh, made a major actor in political history. Lenin's imperialism, his book on imperialism, draws out the inherent or intimate connection between capitalist, the capitalist economy and militarism and war. Trotsky was much less disciplined in a sense than Lenin, but charismatic, a wonderful orator, major theoretician. He only became a key member of the Bolshevik party in the, in the days between May and October of 1917, because we have to remember that both of them were in exile uh, when the February Revolution of 1917 broke out. Lenin had to come back from exile from Switzerland across a war-torn Europe. He got back in early April, which is significant. Trotsky came back from Nova Scotia, where he was in exile in North America and arrived, I think, in May. Uh, it was Trotsky who became a key figure in the Soviet, which was the key organ of working class power in Petrograd, Petersburg and throughout Russia, ha having been leader of the Soviet in the 1905 revolution. Most of the Bolshevik party was fairly reluctant about the possibility of building a socialist society. The party itself had become fairly conservative it had become very pessimistic because of the experience of the First World War and the fact that a lot of labor movement activists became drawn into the war. It did require someone like Lenin to basically see the opportunity to understand that at that moment in time, the only way that the interest of, of, of the people of Russia could be defended and, and, and taken forward was not just by marking time, but actually seizing power. And I think to that extent, Lenin's role was quite unique. Leadership is always important. Uh, leadership is important, but as long as it's sensitive to the actual conditions. Leadership, when you just lead people over the top and there's no chance of winning, then that's a no-no. And in fact, in July of 1917, Lenin uh, was in a position where, in a sense, he had to try and hold back the working class in Petrograd, who were triumphalist and were not quite in a position to move forward. So there had to be an adjustment. And it's this sensitivity, this saying, this is the time, this is not the time. So when he would hear from all the commissars in the factories and in the soldiers' uh, units what was happening, he would be able to interpret it and send it back, a two-way process, an iteration process of knowing exactly what was happening. And also being sensitive to the wider objective factors, which is what is the right wing doing, you know, what are the moderates doing? What's the state of the war? What's happening in broader Russia? So it's a sy systemic, strategic overview. And in that sense, uh, his leadership is absolutely crucial. But it's crucial because he had the backing of vast numbers of ordinary people. And that's demonstrable throughout this whole period. People often portrayed Lenin as this kind of aggressive, dictatorial guy. 
But what he said was really quite commonsensical. He was saying there's no point in telling people what they already know. You know, so when workers are joining trade unions, we don't need to be there telling them to make trade unions. We need to be there to try and look beyond that immediate struggle and see what the next step is, you know, what's the next stage. And that's the role he played. The, the notion of the iconoclastic leader, inspirational leader, you know, the kind of Stalin, Hitler, you know, someone who can get up on stage and shout loudly and people will follow because they have got loud voices um, somehow. They psychologically get into the minds of people and, you know, just, just complete garbage in terms of what really happens here. Trotsky also famously developed something which is largely misunderstood, which is the theory of permanent revolution, sometimes known as the theory of combined development. And what this is in, in essence is that even though a country might be backward, like Russia, the general state of the world market and the world economy had reached a point where it was possible to overjump every single stage. And in contradistinction to many of the other Bolsheviks and some of the other revolutionaries, he thought it was therefore necessary in order to actually move forward that you didn't have to go through a stages conception of revolution. And this was particularly the case in a place like Petersburg, Petrograd, which had a high concentration of highly skilled workers who'd come together relatively quickly by European standards in 20 or 30 years uh, and were very, very uh, class conscious. And I think that's a point which I think speaks to many of the things which are misunderstood, which was that we're not talking about a collection of conspirators uh, operating behind closed doors like Guy Fawkes or modern terrorists. We're looking at, uh, at an organisation which had deep roots in the working class and both led the working class and was responsive to the working class. As soon as we are strong enough to defeat capitalism as a whole, we shall immediately take it by the scruff of the neck. <laughs> If Lenin hadn't turned up at the Finland station in 1917, there would have been no Bolshevik revolution. When Lenin arrived back in April, he formulated, through what was became known as the April Thesis, the idea that now was the opportunity. It wasn't a question of kowtowing to the provincial government, which was uh, still linked with the autocracy, had a, a large con composition of a, a party called the Cadets, Constitutional Democrats, who were neither constitutional nor democratic, and that other organisations, even the social revolutionaries and the Mensheviks, were subordinate to them. He said, look, the power is there. And he developed the slogan, uh, along with a minority of his own comrades, of all power to the Soviets that the only way forward was to, to, to keep power in the hands of the working class and to constantly put pressure on and look around for the opportunities for moving forward. And this is crystallised in the April Thesis. So many radicals, particularly Marxist-inspired radicals of the time, had this very mechanical, doctrinaire understanding of social change where uh, a, an absolutist, feudal-style government as the Tsarist monarchy had been had to be replaced by a liberal, republican or constitutional form of government, which then in turn, in the fullness of time, at some indeterminate point in the future, would be displaced by a socialist, a socialist democracy, a workers' government. And to Lenin's mind, in the context of the World War, this vision of social change became an excuse and a barrier to actually enacting the social change that was necessary at the time, and that it was necessary not to hold into this fixed schema of sticking with the provisional government, the bourgeois liberal government that was still fighting the war, but to overthrow it. That's the characteristic that we should often remember about Lenin, is he didn't have it his own way. He had to constantly explain and explain and explain. He had to win battles and win arguments. Even through to October, uh, there were voices against uh, any form of uh, revolutionary change. I mean, the biggest myth, um, and it's a point worth stressing time and time again, is the idea that it wasn't a working class revolution. And that in fact, if it hadn't have happened, uh, Russia would have developed a wonderful liberal democracy, which would not, would not have been the case. Every single member of the, uh, of the Duma and the provisional government, uh, particularly under Kerensky, were constantly pushing back the working class 
and accommodating with forces to the right, culminating in almost a total counter-revolution in August, which was stopped not by the conspirators in their room, but by the mass activity of the working class, tearing up railway lines as counter-revolutionary forces tried to move in on Petrograd. That's the biggest myth. It was a mass movement of ordinary people to transform their lives. General Kornilov, the commander-in-chief, was not satisfied with the government's efforts to restore order and continue the war. Another example, again from the July days, and probably when they went over the top, there's a wonderful quotation of when a, a, a social revolutionary leader called Chernov went to talk to some workers to try and dissuade them from activity. One of the workers screamed in his face, seize the power, you son of a bitch, when it's given to you. Uh, people often imagine that a revolution has to be a direct reaction against some terrible acts of violent repression. Um, one of the interesting things is that by October 1917, Russia was probably one of the more liberal societies in, in Europe, um, but it wasn't enough to satisfy the democratic aspirations of the Russian people. The Soviets were uh, workers and soldiers' councils directly elected by people, and they were a kind of form of direct democracy. Today we think about democracy as being about parliamentary democracy. Uh, in State and Revolution, Lenin made the point that in order to have proletarian democracy, you would definitely need representative institutions, but you would have to do away with parliamentarianism, which might seem contradictory, but I think what he meant by that was understanding that parliaments were generally a kind of democratic facade uh, behind which the state continued to exercise power uh, on behalf of a minority class. The Bolshevik conception of democracy was rather that the democratic institutions of the people would actually exercise power themselves. It was a Soviet revolution because the whole idea was to put the Soviets in power. He called it dual power, you know, that the Soviet governments had existed alongside the parliamentary system. But the dual power was uh, just a, a way of saying one of them's got to go. The question is, who's going to survive? Is it the Soviets or is it the Duma? What the Bolshevik Revolution means is that it's the, the Duma that will be swept aside. They'll create a Soviet government, a whole different idea of democracy from the one that preceded, the kind of English model or the American model, which was essentially that businessmen and lawyers would represent the nation and they would sit in a special place and talk about how to organise industry and capitalism to the best effect of the property-owning classes. A Soviet government was different because it was about working people. They weren't interested in making sure that businessmen could make their profits. They were interested in making a government which served all the people. The pro-capitalist and pro-Tsarist parties were free to stand for election to the Soviets if they wanted to. It was only after the revolution in 1918, uh, when the forces of counter-revolution tried to stage a coup, that new rules were introduced which, which listed those who were no longer allowed to stand for election to the Soviets, which included employers, businessmen, czarists and aristocrats. The imperial government fell and revolution reigned. The chains were broken and in violence was born the government of the proletarian. Normally in political language, uh, the words dictatorship and democracy would, would be seen as polar opposites of the political spectrum. If you think about the dictatorship of the proletariat, as uh, Marx and then Lenin talked about it, however, it's actually quite close to the original conception of democracy. If we go back to ancient Athens, the origins of the word democracy come from the, the Greek for demos, the people, the mass of the people, and kratos, power or control. So it's about the people exercising control over the society. And I think the dictatorship of the proletariat is a different way of expressing that kind of democratic uh, impulse uh, for popular control. Lenin argued that in, until the revolution, Russia was dominated by the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, which he, basically the way he saw it was the capitalist class who relied upon their institutions, their sources of power to maintain and reproduce society. And what Lenin argued was that even the implementation of workers' democracy would still constitute a form of dictatorship. You know, in this case, the dictatorship of the majority of society is the way that he kind of put it. You know, the class domination of, of, the, of workers and peasants would have to be defended by force if necessary, just like the class domination of the capitalist class beforehand. Contrary to the impression that's often given today, neither Marx nor Lenin were in favour of state control of everything. In fact, they had a conception of what Marx talked about as the withering away of the state, that eventually 
after the establishment of the dictatorship of the proletariat, of majority rule, you could actually create a classless society in which uh, state power, the dictatorship of one class over another, uh, would be unnecessary and, and wouldn't exist. Um, that obviously is not something that ever came to pass, and we, instead the revolution turned into Stalinist tyranny. But it was never part of a Marxist or Leninist uh, conception that the state would continue to control society in the way that socialism and communism are talked about today. I'm somewhat stunned by this argument. I suppose I should take it seriously because it's so widespread. But mob rule is when people without any coherent political position or one intoxicated by hatred uh, go on a, a rampage, such as the pogroms against the Jews, the Black Hundreds, or you might say a pointless riot uh, um, fueled by alcohol you know, without any direction at all. None of that happened in the Russian Revolution. It was, it was discussed and argued for and it was built by collective organisation and it's demeaning and irresponsible and misses out the entire point of the incredible discipline of uh, the forces at work in that period. People don't go out and lay their lives on the line because they're brainwashed. It's because they passionately believe in what they are doing. There's a strong temptation to turn the Russian Revolution into a moral fable about the evils of attempts to change the world for the better and the terrible consequences that flow from that. But that doesn't actually look at the processes that were at work or try to understand them in any meaningful or significant way. So if we compare the violence of the February Revolution, say, which was much more violent than the October Revolution, Many hundreds of people died in the February Revolution in Petrograd because you saw the disorderly collapse of the Tsarist regime, the struggle to overthrow it and replace it, whereas only a handful of people died in the October Revolution, reflecting by contrast the degree of discipline and organisation that was brought to the overthrow of the provisional government and the popular support that the Bolsheviks enjoyed by that stage. The categorical reality is that the violence of the uh, Tsarist authoritarian regime was preeminent. Thousands and thousands and thousands of ordinary Russians suffered death, exile to Siberia, persecution. You can catalogue this through the whole of the 19th century and in the 1905 revolution and the 1917 revolution. In the period of the revolutionary upheaval, let's say from February to October and slightly afterwards, I would say the revolutionary forces were remarkably <laughs> unviolent. There wasn't the kind of massacres and bloodshed that often occurs and did later occur in the Civil War because they'd really kind of won already, you know, they'd organised the thing. And when they stormed the Winter Palace, you know, famously, they had, when they were filming it, they had to restage the storming of the Winter Palace because it was over quite quick. You know, you ran into the Winter Palace and you get there and everybody's scarpered. But in any event, I think it was kind of a much more jubilant, optimistic kind of a mood, you know, a bit like CLR. James would have said, you know, every cook can govern, and suddenly they were governing, and they had lots of decisions to make, and they were really pleased and excited, and, and there was a great mood of optimism, you can see it in the arts and culture and in education, where people were getting down to the business and making a new society. I would attribute the acts of violence much more to the forces of stability trying to maintain their status quo, rather than ones trying to change. But to suggest it's the act of revolution which is violent is, uh, I think, a nonsense. It's also worth remembering that one of the main reasons for the October 1917 revolution was a reaction against the terrible violence and brutality of the First World War. Soldiers were in the front rank of the revolutionary movement. They wanted an end to the violence uh, of the war. <laughs> very difficult today to uh, recall the fact that in 1917-1918 the Russian Revolution did capture the imagination of, of people all over the world, not just in Europe but also in large parts of Asia, lar you know, large parts of North America, Latin America. People began to think that there is more than one way of organizing society and in particular you had a situation where the labor movement itself very much came under the influence 
of, of these kinds of sentiments where the intellectuals were very much drawn towards this kind of radical ideology that was coming out of Moscow. And yet a, an, an incredible uh, renaissance in filmmaking in the arts, which tried to, in a sense, take a leap forward and to show the way to a society that wasn't just more of the same. It changed international politics. For example, during the Treaty of Versailles and the conversations at the end of the First World War about the future world order, what was really going on was a debate between Wilson and Lenin. Lenin wasn't at the table, but the fact that the, the Bolsheviks had put forward this idea of self-determination, that this should be a principle that should be applied to all nations, filled Wilson and the big powerful states, the elites, with a huge amount of dread because they recognized two things. One, that there was a constituency within their own societies that actually looked to the Bolshevik Revolution as something that was something they should emulate, and that they also had colonial empires, that the people in the, em in the empires, in their colonies, were looking at the Russian Revolution and saying, hmm, why shouldn't our country belong to us? And they start asking, and they start clamoring for exactly that same uh, aspiration. And of course, this causes a huge amount of, of disruption because they now begin to fear that their ability to hold on to power, to hold on to these areas of the world, are now going to come under serious threat. <laughs> At the time of the Russian Revolution, Western political elites were terrified. I mean, the Russian Revolution was a profound political, social and economic challenge to Western capitalist states. We don't have anything like that now. But to be clear, uh, the challenge was not because of Russian foreign policies, the challenge was domestically within Western states. For one brief moment, there was a real possibility that German workers, maybe even some English workers, would follow their Russian comrades and attempt to overthrow the political system. Almost immediately in, in the aftermath of the Russian Revolution, you had governments and political parties adopting far more radical measures in terms of uh, running their affairs than they would have done otherwise, where you had centrist and even right-wing political parties all of a sudden calling themselves uh, socialist, Christian socialist, or some kind of national socialist or another. In reaction to what happened in Russia, state intervention in economic life uh, becomes increasingly much more acceptable in order to preempt the rise of uh, domestic radical movements. You have the beginning of what would become the, the welfare state being created uh, in the interwar period. So much of what happens in political life in the post-17 period, 1917 period, is really a reaction to Russian revolution, to prevent it, to preempt it, to, to evade the issues that were raised by it. And that is very important for us to remember. <music> There's another book that I'd like to show you, which is really interesting, and it's called Shop Talks on Economics. It's basic Marxist economics. It's addressed to working class people and trade unionists. We know that labour power is a commodity like shoes or hats or stoves. A commodity only has value, exchange value, because it contains human labour. I think what's important to realise is that at that time, these were discussions that people, ordinary people, were having. Mass movements were so threatening in Glasgow that the government of the day had to send in tanks and troops in order to quell industrial unrest. Even a, a fairly stable society like Britain was not immune to the new forms of working class politics that was emerging. And uh, although Britain never had the uh, revolutionary moment that, for example, Germany had and Hungary had. Nevertheless, there was a general kind of sense that uh, what happened in Russia may well be a, a symptom of similar radical revolts breaking out all over Europe. Another interesting thing that we found when clearing out my grandparents' house were these bonds. There was a stack of bonds. So it was a way of 
raising money to support the new Soviet state by working class people. They would buy a bond, they would buy a share in this future. And I just thought that that was really fantastic, that ordinary working class people would be buying these things and, and in, in that way supporting the revolution. But now a genuine civil war breaks out in Russia. 1917 to 1919, 1920. You did have a, an incredibly bloody civil war being inflicted upon Russian societies. The prospect of socialism, of emancipation of land for the peasants and of workers' self-rule, the hatred that that evoked in the old aristocratic elites, in the bosses, the capitalists, the factory managers of the time, of liberals who were hor horrified by the prospect of being ruled by their social inferiors, and, of course, of the extensive support that the counter-revolutionaries, that the enemies of the Bolsheviks enjoyed from Western states of the time, with Western military intervention, all of this contributed to the tremendous violence of the Civil War. The very anachronistic way in which the Russian Revolution is seen as this kind of monstrous act, it very much overlooks the context of Civil War, where there was no negotiation, there was no dialogue, there was no debate, where there was a question of whether or not the regime that was established in October would survive or not. And the only way it could possibly survive was by defending itself. And I think at that point in time, uh, the kind of uh, policies adopted by Lenin were arguably fairly defensive in, in form. They weren't uh, uh, an aggressive policy of expansionism. They tended to have a fairly defensive sort of character to it. The Soviet government, Bolshevik-led Soviet government, no doubt did use terror, that's clear. They were a government and they were being attacked. They used force to repress those people that were attacking them. It was a war. When Victor Serge says it's really a case of kill or be killed, you can see what he's saying and it's right, you know, because they were confronted with the fact that they might be just wiped out and the reaction would win and all the prison would be the best that could happen to you. One of the white generals, the Baron von Ungarn, one of the most um, terrifying and depraved individuals to emerge from the Russian Civil War, illustrates in many ways what was involved in the counter-revolution. Years before Hitler had taken control of the Nazi party, the Baron von Ungarn was already proclaiming his determination to wipe out the Jewish race in its entirety, and for instance, led a utterly bizarre insurgency against the Bolsheviks in eastern Russia and Siberia, supported by the Japanese state, carved out the hearts of his captured prisoners and to sacrifice them to Tibetan Buddhist gods, inspired by hell scrolls of Buddhist scripture. So a Buddhist version of ISIS in the Russian civil war in the 1920s, led by a depraved megalomaniac sadist, gives some indication of the sinister forces that had been unleashed and the terrifying depravity and cruelty that was brought up in order to defeat the Bolsheviks and to crush them and to replace them with something infinitely more sinister and authoritarian in opposition to the idea of workers' rule and land for the peasants. The ability of the Soviet regime to survive almost certainly depended on terrifying their enemies. Now this is what terror is. The white terror was much more vicious. The red terror was a direct response to this. Remember that the, the regime had uh, got rid of the death penalty in 19, in, as part of the October 17 settlement, alongside toleration of uh, homosexuality, uh, of equal rights for women, and many other things that we almost take for granted now that no other regime would have countenanced. And, it, and even the head of the Cheka, the secret police of, under the Bolsheviks, Zhuzhinsky, was pained. Of course, people will say, oh, yes, but you know, he would afterwards. But he said, there is too much blood on my hands. You know, I should be dead. Yeah? There was a sense of that, this, that, that this was a terrible thing to have to do, which you find nowhere in the uh, responses of the white terror. Yes, it was vicious. Yes, it was terrible, like any civil war, whether it's in Spain or in Britain or anywhere but it was a response that every individual at that time had to settle their own accounts with, both morally and politically. And I'm really pleased that I didn't have to make those decisions. Mm -hmm.
Allied troops fight to keep Russia in the war. Within months of the Russian Revolution, the armies of Germany, of France, of Britain, of America, of Japan, of Poland and Serbia had intervened in a vicious civil war which drained a country already starving with famine and after the experience of three years of war. All these great leaders of the democracies uh, like Churchill, like Wilson in America, however liberal they were, they were determined to crush Bolshevism and they sent the armies in straight away. The minute they'd wrapped up the European war, they were going to uh, wage war to overthrow the Bolshevik government on the side of the people that were, came to be known as the Whites. You know, but they had the Red Army and so there was this counter army of all the reactionaries and generals and all the miserable people that were fed up with the whole thing. They were determined to crush it. So the White Army was rallied with the support of the Western democracies, uh, democracies so-called. The White Army had you know, some success. They caused a lot of chaos all across Russia. Winston Churchill, who referred to the Bolsheviks as Bolshevik baboonery, and he said furthermore, kill the Bolshe, kiss the Hun. His old enemy, the Germans, uh, they had to be allies against this terrifying threat to the international uh, capitalist class. This here is Alf's copy of the red paper on executions and atrocities committed in Russia by the Czechoslovaks and Russian counter-revolutionaries, assisted by the Allies. And what's interesting about this is that people tend to think of the Russian Revolution and the Bolsheviks uh, and Lenin as bloodthirsty barbarians. And what this pamphlet shows you is actually the really bloodthirsty atrocities committed by the white armies against the Bolsheviks and against the, the revolution. It's interesting to read some of the extracts. Here's one from August the 7th, 1918, the letter written by one of the counter-revolutionary executioners on the Don. The harvest was pretty good, and every evening, apart from the tribunal, numerous Bolshevik prisoners were disposed of, sometimes a hundred, sometimes three hundred, and in one night, five hundred have been dispatched. The mode of procedure was as follows. Fifty men dug their own common grave, then they were shot, and the other fifty men would cover them up and dig a new grave side by side, and so on. There are, however, so many of them that we have decided to their great discomfiture to turn the Red Guards into slaves. Pretty strong stuff. The US commander in Siberia in the armies of intervention, I think his name was Major General Graves, makes the point that for every one person killed by the Bolsheviks, the white armies killed a hundred. The physical cost of military intervention in Russia by foreign powers did uh, cause a major upheaval and had a very, very kind of destructive impact upon Russian society. Amongst other things, it led to the death of a very large section of the uh, of the Bolshevik movement. And therefore, by you know, 1924, many of the leading far-sighted revolutionaries were in effect dead. So the party itself uh, lost its, its most important, its most dynamic section. A year after the October Revolution, the German Revolution broke out in November 1918 beginning with a naval mutiny in the port city of Kiel. The imperial monarchy of the Kaiser was overthrown, a republican government was established and power fell into the hands of the right-wing uh, social democrats, the German social democrats. And their hostility and suspicion to the popular energies that had been unleashed by the revolution and their determination to control and limit it led them to liquidate the left wing of the German revolutionary workers' movement. They organised the right-wing paramilitaries who murdered the anti-war left-wing of the German workers' movement, the leaders of that, who were Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg. The circumstances that conspired to bring about the degeneration of the Russian Revolution were, in fact, failures of politics, of subjectivity, in many other parts of the world. So, for example, if you'd have an industrial power like Germany become Bolshevik, 
we would we'd have a different outcome, and 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 we wouldn't be talking about Stalin. Maybe we'd be talking about something else. But the possibilities then of realizing the aspirations and the goals of what what that revolution was all about would have had much greater chance of survival. So the paradox of the Russian Revolution is that its success would only have come from outside of Russia itself. It would have looked close to what actually happened because you had mutinies of soldiers, you had mass strikes, you had all sorts of political tumult, upheaval throughout the industrialized world at the time. And if those struggles had been taken further, you would have seen a revolution break out in the industrialized core and that would have seen revolutionary states established in the West. The reality is Lenin and many others never thought it was going to work. The key factor for them was that it would be, it would be initiating and part of a broader European revolution. Being so poor, so agricultural, so backwards, war ravaged and isolated, the failure of the revolutions in Europe, that the result would be that the revolution in Russia would collapse back into the old patterns of Russian history where you have national modernization led by ruthless centralizing bureaucrats. So from that point of view, I don't think Stalinism should be seen as a historical surprise. Trotsky's organization of the Red Army won the war, but it also decimated that section of people. And again, on top of that, we have famine, we have the inability to get crops, we have therefore a, a much more ambivalent peasantry, because the peasantry is not the cohesive force that the working class is in the cities, and they need to feed themselves, and they're also under pressure. Then you have to look at how difficult it was to maintain a form of workers' democracy in such an environment. Yeah? And then that opens the door uh, for a bureaucracy and for a, an authoritarian regime. Within Russian society itself, you had the crystallization of fairly uh, conservative trends within the Bolshevik party itself, where, in a sense, the, the new political bureaucracy and the, and the state institutions converged around the leadership of Stalin. And the problem from the mid-20s onwards was that the, the remnants of the political leadership, increasingly under Stalin, uh, pretended that this was not going wrong. And the only voice against that after Lenin's death was Trotsky. And Trotsky's, from the mid-twenties, was the voice saying, well, this was wrong, that was wrong. But increasingly he was more divorced and in exile and then assassinated. But the central feature was the fact that the bureaucracy spawns bureaucracy. It spawns a, a defense of its own interests. And theoretically, and in practical terms, it also spawned a counter-revolutionary idea, the idea of socialism in one country, in which the, the whole premise of Russia becoming a, a beacon for a wider world revolution was that everything was subordinated to the maintenance of the leadership inside Russia. It's impossible. In a world economy, you cannot have a revolution in one country, especially a country as backward as Russia. Some of the more thinking critics, like someone like Hannah Arendt, talk about um, the movement from what they call the dictatorship of the proletariat to the dictatorship of the party, uh, as if it was somehow inevitable. It was um, something um, inexorable, something in inherent within the idea of the dictatorship of the proletariat that led to the dictatorship of the party. Actually, I think if you look at what happened historically, you'd have to say that the movement towards the dictatorship of the party or the party bureaucracy uh, under Stalin is really based on the defeat of the revolution and usurpation of power by the Stalinist bureaucracy who used the language of the dictatorship of the proletariat to justify the control of the party machine. In everyday propaganda, there's a tendency to confuse the meaning of what Bolshevism is. Uh, see Bolshevism as merely a variant of Stalinism. Whereas in fact, there were some very fundamental differences. For the Bolsheviks, internationalism wasn't just simply a sign of Sunday school speechifying, but it really did mean something very, very important, that internationalism basically meant that uh, only when movements in Russia could count on the support and solidarity of other, other governments and the labor movement in other parts of the world, could there be enough of a, a dynamic to change the world in, in the right kind of way as, as they saw it. Stalin, you know, he didn't actually stop using the language of internationalism, but he basically betrayed its spirit by opting for a, a very nationalistic approach where what really was important was building up the infrastructure and the, and the institutions of, of, of Soviet society in Russia.
you could argue that that degeneration of the Bolshevik party into, into the Stalinist clique destroys the revolutionary potential that existed, particularly in the colonial world, where the communist parties now simply just become the mouthpiece of this, uh, or the propaganda wing of this degenerate bureaucracy. You can see this really clearly in South Africa, you know, where the Communist Party, you know, leading the struggle against the attempt by Britain to, to change the colour bar in industry, where they come up with this incredible slogan, which is workers of the world unite to keep South Africa white. You know, I mean, who, who in their right mind would think that that had any kind of revolutionary other than reactionary uh, consequences? It lowered, systematically lowered people's horizons away from a wider, more universal model of human emancipation and social progress and change to one that was contained within nations, the one that was contained within countries. To take an example of that, when we see the British Communist Party supporting the war effort in the Second World War, even to the extent of suppressing striking miners when miners went out on strike during the war in order to get the workers back into work as part of the overall war effort. You see there the results of that fusion of radicalism and nationalism that is embodied in the Stalinist political project. The fact that it happened is really the important thing. Not that we can live off that today because all of that, I think, has been destroyed. I think today we're all obviously overwhelmed, not by that revolutionary moment that occurred, but the fact that it failed. And I think one of the most fascinating features of the last hundred years is you have arguably the single most important event of the 20th century all of a sudden fading from memory to so, so much that it leaves no legacy behind. That, you know, a revolution and a, and a movement, the communist movement, which you know, haunted governments throughout the West and which provided the resources for a lot of the political conflicts that occurred in many parts of the world, that movement no longer means anything. It, it just simply has disappeared and that's almost uh, historically un unprecedented. I think that too needs to be reflected upon. We are in a society that likes to look at dates and to look at anniversaries. The centenary of the Russian Revolution won't have the same popularity as the 50 years since uh, Sergeant Pepper. Much as I like Sergeant Pepper, it's probably a much more significant event. It's shaped the whole history of the 20th century, and also for good or ill. The fact that the revolution did not succeed opens the door for the assumption that it could never have succeeded, and that everything that's gone wrong in the world since the Russian Revolution can be put at the door of the revolution. And that's why, if there is going to be any form of discussion about it, it will be to castigate the revolution. But the point we need to understand, and we may sit in different areas about uh, how to, to do it, is that it represents a wonderful example of people taking control of their own lives and grappling with the idea of changing society. I think today people are living in the present. The past is the past, but the past is just unimportant. There's no sense of historical perspective on anything. Because we are so caught in the present moment, there's no attempt to even look at the future. And I don't think if you, if you look at the future, you have to take into account history. Uh, because that gives you an enormous perspective on you know, what's peculiar about the present and also what's not rigid about the present. It is interesting that uh, when you look at the commemoration of the revolution, an extraordinary amount of the resources that have been devoted to it are to do with uh, the art of 1917. And you have to ask the question why that is. And at first, I thought it was perhaps a way of avoiding some of the more complicated, difficult questions. It, you know, it's always nice to look at uh, interesting drawings and paintings, you know, going to uh, sort of an art gallery or a museum and look at sort of Lizitsky or, or some other artist's works. But I think there's also something more to it. I think particularly history that's to do with difficult issues has a growing tendency to become Disneyfied in the world that we live in. And in many respects, what we see 
is a process where the commemoration of the Russian Revolution becomes coterminous with the Disneyfication of the Russian Revolution, where it acquires this kind of uh, commodified, very safe kind of form, where the Russian Revolution is kind of treated as almost like an entertainment format that we can sort of appreciate in a hundred years later. I think if you look at the the art of the revolutionary period, it is very instructive and you can see it as a cipher or a metaphor for what was happening inside the revolutionary period. It demonstrates quite a lot of things. The most recent exhibition uh, in London it illustrates the decline of the revolutionary potential, a movement of hugely experimental, exciting and innovative art being re replaced by the turgidity of socialist realism. But even that exhibition pales into insignificance beside one which was at the Haywood many years ago. And it wasn't just the art, it was everything. It was the design of teapots. It, everything was infused with this potential and this excitement. And I remember there was this huge banner uh, going from the ceiling to the, to the floor of the Haywood with a quotation from the Russian poet Mayakovsky, which went, the streets are our brushes, the squares are our pallets, we are the armed revolutionary army of art. Uh, heroic. And so it wasn't the leader, it's the follower, but it's emblematic of what was going on. It's fashionable to view um, Russian history as one long continuum of horrors, really, from the Bolshevik Revolution to the Gulag, uh, to Chechnya, to Putin. Um, but I would argue this is a very problematic view of history. I think this has become a way of understanding most historical events. It's a very ahistorical approach in that, of course, events are always a consequence of both local, specific local factors and, you know, broader international trends. I would be extremely uh, worried if um, a historian in a sixth form college either went in by s to say that this was, um, everything was wonderful about it, and I would be equally as worried uh, if um, somebody said it was incredibly terrible. You go to the sources, you go to the arguments, and you recognise its significance as a historical event. Um, you don't uh, dress up as a peasant and uh, try to plant um, um, potatoes in the middle of the winter in order to understand deprivation. Yeah. Who in their right mind today would defend the Tsar? <laughs> Maybe people who uphold the monarchy in Britain today would, 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 uphold the, would defend the Tsar. But that's the whole point. That whole order was destroyed. And that kind of says to you that that order that was at that point in time must, might have held to be the natural order of things was no longer the natural order. That it was man-made, it was historically specific, and therefore the fact that it changed means that perhaps it could change again. And that's uncomfortable. I think it should be taught as part of his, the history of human civilization, of the ambivalence that there is in human existence, where things happen, things change, People change, societies change, societies go through transformations. And we should teach this as a way of making a new generation of people comfortable with the idea that you know, what we see in front of us is not solid. It's man-made. It's historically specific. It can change. It has been different in the past, and it could be different in the future. Well, I think we have to re realize that uh, today's uh, view of history as leading from one horrible event to another is very much uh, a function of, of the way that we experience the world today. I think there's a powerful mood of pessimism. Uh, there's a powerful mood of misanthropy where we mistrust other people. Because of this zeitgeist that we're going through, there's a tendency to read history backwards. This kind of history that begins in the 19th century moves on to the Russian Revolution, seamlessly becomes entwined with the Holocaust and the Nazi totalitarian regime, and it all becomes wrapped up into this one package where the whole story is really a story of evil and malevolence. And I think that kind of history, that you know, the history where everything is bad and negative, uh, very much reflects our own uh, sort of imagination, our own ahistorical or anti-historical way of looking at things, uh, rather than anything uh, that says very much about what happened in the past. History is full of lessons, 
But the most important lesson is that you have to look at the specific circumstances. And if I go back and look at um, the understanding of, of Lenin in particular, and also of Trotsky, uh, I'd say the lesson is that you must understand your relationship to the, your fellow citizens. The lesson of the Russian Revolution is that people make history, but not necessarily in circumstances of their own making. It's not